you only have a finite amount of time to make as much money as possible, maximize your connections, to set yourself up for the rest of your life. This is Dave Melcher with Entrepreneurs, The Playbook, and I have super agent Harrison Gaines of Slash Sports and Entertainment. Harrison, it's like looking into a mirror when we're going to do this interview <laughs> because you are in the job I used to have, and I would say the most common question that entrepreneurs ask me is how do you get a job in sports, and furthermore, I want to be a sports agent. So the first question is obvious. How did you evolve to be a top agent in NBA and multiple comp uh, sports now. Uh, well, first, thanks for having me, Davis. A uh, pleasure to be here. You know, I'd say it was a it was a long term grind. Um, I started off. I first off, I loved the game. I played basketball. I wanted to be like any other person who plays the game and and be in the NBA. But you know, everybody realized the ball stops bouncing at some point in time. And so for me, that realization was probably my sophomore year at at Penn. And I realized that I was gonna have to start preparing for my second career. And my father was the first person that said to me, he was like, you know, you should think about being an agent. I think that would be a good transition for you. And for me, when I thought about it, I was like, I was somebody who always mentored younger players that were coming up under me, having them work out, you know, giving them advice. And so I started to research and I researched, you know, the top agents and saw what type of background they had. And I saw that everybody wore different types of hats and it really wasn't just uh, you know, just a one-stop shop as far as being an agent that you had to be an array of things. But one thing I noticed was that everybody went to, you know, had some type of legal background, at least at that time. You didn't have to have it, but most of the top guys did. So I went on the trek to, you know, to go to law school. I finished up. I ended up finishing up my undergrad at UC Riverside and, and finished out playing there and got an internship with Impact Sports uh, at the time. Impact had Kawhi Leonard. They had Will Barton. They had a, you know, a full-fledged uh, football practice as well. And I just started to learn the business under the agents there. And I did an array of roles, you know, as far as maybe it was social media, if it was, you know, doing stuff with the guys during pre-draft process, driving the vans, uh, you know, rebounding for guys, you know, whatever it took, I was learning. And then I'd go to different events, just learning as much as I could about the business, whether that was talking to different NBA personnel or anybody in the business to just, to just learn. You know, I was just trying to gain as much knowledge as possible. And, you know, once I got out of law school, you know, I had a breakthrough just as far as being able to, you know, signed some different players right out of law school and I started slash sports and just went from there. So there's a couple places there that we have to help people with. One, that first job's the hardest job and I'll tell you why. Most people aren't willing to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Most people's egos, I mean, you went to the Ivy League, then transferred and played mm -hmm. basketball in college mm -hmm. and they don't wanna go and you know rebound. They don't wanna go and drive a car. Uh, they don't want to make zero to six hundred dollars a week or a month, mm -hmm. right? They're not willing to sacrifice. How did you get your first job? In you know beyond just the the jobs you were doing, what types of sacrifice did you have to to endure to do that? I mean the you know how I got it was my my brother's AAU coach had had a connection with Impact Sports. He had knew the the guy the owner uh, Mitch Frankel and so he had put me in contact with the the leadership there and that included Brian Elfis uh, who was who was Kawhi's agent at the time and it was you know I, I had to call them like plenty of times like it wasn't <laughs> just a connection like I had to call so many times to finally before they gave me an internship and then once I got it like I knew that you know, I had to do, you have to do a little job before you can do the big job. And you, there was so much to learn. This is a business that it's hard to break into. Not too many people do it. So there's only, there's not too many people you can talk to about it because everybody hasn't experienced it. So for me, it was like, okay, I have this opportunity. Let me just learn as much as I can, whatever it is. Let me be with the players all the time. Let me, you know, see what their thought process is on agent selection, how they view the current agents, what what is needed for client maintenance, you know, things of that nature as we got into, you know, as I got into doing more contract work, the intricacies of the contracts, uh, you know, just 
how to do the, the business behind things, the the pitfalls and the successes that that came, you know, within, you know, when I was when I was working with Impact and just seeing that, you know, everything from the inside. But it was, you know, it was a challenge because like I started off, I was still playing division one basketball when I started working with them. And, you know, for a lot of guys that age, I was, you know, 21 and 21, 22, and everybody's so focused just still on hoop. And I had to take that step back and say, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, focus on this while I'm still finishing up school, while I'm still playing basketball, because I know this is going to take me into the future. And I wasn't making any money, but it was, but I knew that starting early and getting that education it was going to benefit me later on so i just kind of took that and uh and that got me through the tougher times that's awesome and then the second thing that you did was extraordinary and the most important part now i tell people all the time only reason i would go to law school to be an agent is one you're more capable Mm -hmm. right there's a lot of contract work right there's negotiations there's collective bargaining there's labor law there's a variety of things that you have to do Mm -hmm. as well as the communication skills that assist you but the main thing you have to be able to do in order to be a sports agent, because you can hire guys like that, mm-hmm. is to be able to sign players. Right. Right. And yes, a law degree helps you because most of the players, they're looking to see what experience, knowledge, and skills you have, and they want you to have some legal background. Mm-hmm. But I do know some agents that are great at attaching emotionally to a player mm-hmm. and figuring out the legal side with additional help uh, in that respect. How do you think or what gift have you been given? What skills do you use? Because one of the things I look back on your career and you have some really great players and have had great players, but you were able to sign guys really early Mm -hmm. and your reputation, like when we met, your reputation precedes you that, you know, you are a good person, that you are a kind person and responsible and person that cares about your players, not just about the money. But what do you think it was that allowed you to sign players at, you know, such a young, young age right out of law school? I think it was just it was my ability to relate to not only the players, but the parents as well. Um, that's important to be able to, because when when a player is making a decision, it's not they're so young, they're just not making the decision by themselves. It's their sphere of influence, and for me to be able to connect to everybody involved, that was able to give me a lot of early success, and just you know, and just really just caring about the player as a as an individual like it's not just about basketball it's not just about you know just getting the contracts it's about life after basketball it's about you only have you know and i i looked at the game i look at the game a different way than most guys do because they just look at the immediate for me it's like i know that you only have a finite amount of time to make as much money as possible, maximize your connections to set yourself up for the rest of your life because guys are playing from, you know, five years is the average and you might, if you're lucky, you'll get 10 years, the great guys get 15 or more. And so for me, it was like, okay, people were able to see that I had that long-term view in mind from the start. And it was like, okay, well, we're gonna maximize everything from from while you're in the league to set you up for after because once you're done and you're out the league you're you know for lack of better terms you're not as important anymore the doors don't open like they did before so we're not just gonna okay you're gonna become the best basketball player possible that's gonna set your leverage so I can do what I need to do at the negotiating table but as well you know we're gonna we're gonna use that time outside of the sport to uh, to be in contact with as many business people as possible, to to maximize your brand, to build your brand, to do those sorts of things. So once you're done, you know, you have something to build upon for the rest of your life. And I think that vision, you know, of, of seeing it holistically rather than, OK, let's just get drafted. Let's just get to the check. I think that uh, that allowed me for parents to see me a little bit different from the start which is so important, and we always pitch the legacy side of things, right? Creating Mm -hmm. a brand, creating a legacy, giving back to the community. Uh, Perspective-wise, a lot of young people, really, when they tell you they want to be just like you, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, they teach about Lee and I in in programs now. That's how old we are. Mm -hmm. But when they tell you they want to be just like you, I think to myself, you don't have a clue what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So can you share what the most surprising thing 
from your perspective, from, you know, movies like Jerry Maguire, Arliss, you know, Ballers, all of these different types of mu- movies and TV shows that portray a sports agent in a certain manner. What was the most surprising thing from your perception before you became an agent to now that you're an agent? What's the most surprising thing of what you thought would happen and, and what reality is? I think the most surprising that when you think about a sports agent or you're, you're watching the films and the RLSs and the Jerry Maguire's you think about, so you're just doing contracts all the time that, that it's, you're, you're negotiating the deal, you're getting the big bucks, but there's only, like, there's a time when you're negotiating those contracts, but there's so much time in between. Like, so say for a basketball player, you're getting drafted. You have, it's normally three to four years before you're negotiating that next deal. You know, as far as NBA, we're not talking about endorsements. So how do you enhance your client during that time in between? So when you get to that point, the leverage is at the negotiating table for you to be able to get the best contract, the best deal to set your client up the best way. How can you help that player get from point A to point B? I think that's the thing that goes unnoticed when you're talking about a when you're talking about the profession, because it's not the glamorous work. You know, you're playing. You're playing psychiatrist. You're playing mentor. You're you're playing you know, coach, babysitter. <laughs> you're doing all that. You're managing. You know, managing the personal life. Like all of that is important because your client has to stay as focused as possible on his craft to be able to perform at peak performance, so he can get the numbers. And then when you get the numbers and you're consistent over time, now when you get to the negotiating table, now you can get his fair value or more more than that, you know, is what the goal is. Um, but that time in between is a lot of people don't talk about that. And that's the nitty gritty work that that goes into it because, you know, professional athletes, they're, you know, they're complex people and they're dealing with a lot and being in the limelight and and dealing now with social media and the trolls and and the nonstop news cycle. It's it's, it's not easy for them. So for you being that person in their inner circle, you have to you you it's a it's a heavy job that you have to play in between that time before you get to the point where you know you're you're doing the deals and you're negotiating with the general manager and things of that nature and that's a great perspective because it is i think a divergence of what people dream about and that gritty part of it and Mm -hmm. the amount of work that you have to do that nobody sees that really isn't fun Mm -hmm. uh and you know really can turn you off from the business and put a lot of pressure on you moreover though what do you love the most about being a sports agent i love the personal relationships with with my players like i'm truly invested into their success and it doesn't make a difference like whether you know it's you know, it's, it's Jamal Franklin, and when he, you know, he's able to get, you know, a big contract in China and is able to, you know, buy a house for his mom, or whether it's Odyssey Sims who I have in the WNBA and, and seeing her growth as a player from where she was last year to this year, like that, those relationships and being able to, and what I talked about before, that nitty gritty work during that time, it's tough, but seeing that come to fruition and seeing each player achieve their dreams is what's you know what's valuable for me because you know one thing that you know I always do with my clients and and everybody knows that who's who's work with me it's like I'm going to tell you the truth it's going to be tough love for me and that's because I it's a it comes from a place of love because I want to see you be as great as possible and sometimes there's conversations that you know aren't the prettiest between myself and, and and the clients and but it helps you know it helps them it helps both of us you know achieve achieve our dreams and helps the players get to where they need to go and to see you know a player take a challenge um you know accept it continue to improve because everybody's not a finished product you know when they first come into the nba or they first become a professional player or wnba whatever it is and you know to help that player get to that point and just see that process unfold is you know is rewarding for me because you know it's about you know it's about developing young men and women and and helping them you know take this unique gift that they have and, and maximize it. And, and so that's probably the, the most rewarding out of everything. And one of the things that I pride myself on, you know, from being an agent was seeing the future, mm-hmm. uh, being able to project, you know, how can I monetize 
you know, this irrationality, this emotional attachment that people have to sports? How can I monetize it so I can make more money, help more people and have more fun? Which to me is the triad of sports to me. It's ability in sports. If you're at the top of the game, you make more money than anywhere. You can help more people, impact mm. more people than anywhere. And I think it's more fun than anything else I'd mm. like to do. Um, looking towards the future, all the economic changes with digital media platforms, the TV deals, the digital rights deals, the content deals, all the different sponsorship advertising things that go along with it. If you were going to give advice to some entrepreneurs on, you know, this is what I'd look for in the future in order to monetize my expertise, what advice would you give them? You know, I'd say now, I mean, you're looking at, I mean, the internet, social media, there's so many ways to to monetize now. And I think that's with, you know, anybody that has, you know, you know very well because you're doing a great job of it, uh, just as if you're, you know, any type of influencer, if you have expertise, if you're an athlete, now you can you can bring your audience to yourself now. And if you build up, you know, your social media following, whether that's Twitter, that's Instagram, whether that's YouTube now, you know, there's a lot of money that can be made. And I think that instead of, you know, I, I'd say instead of chasing deals, I'd say you should chase, you should build your build your platform and build your brand so you can have a following and build as many fans because those deals will come if you have that. You know, it's it, it's changed from the fact, you know, years ago where it was just like, okay, the actors and the actresses or the top athletes, they're just getting, you know, all the deals. If you look at all these YouTube stars who were make bringing in millions and millions of dollars a year with not, you know, they don't they don't really have a talent to hang their hat on. You know, some of them do, but, you know, not all of them. That just shows the landscape that's changing. People want to see your daily life. They want to hear what you have to say and you can bring them to yourself. And so what I would say is just build, build, build your following, you know, take what's organic to you and what's uh, what's personal to you. And you never know who who might find inspiration out of that and, and build and, and grow that following. And then next thing you know, you know, you'll be able to monetize it the right way. Last question, because I think you're bringing up a really good point, and it's really a catch-22. So even like Jamal or one of your WNBA stars that have mm -hmm. great influence right now, uh, they're building a brand, uh, but their careers are limited, mm -hmm. and they're unsure, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're one hoop away from the end of their career. You just never know. But there is this conflict because you give up so much of your privacy. You mm -hmm. give so much of your time that, you know, it's easy for someone like me that never was invited as an influencer or celebrity to all the parties, you know, and now that the ESPYs are coming up, it's so much fun because it's like, oh, Dave, you know, show up here, we'll pay for this, we'll do this, we'll fly you to Puerto Rico for this. And I sit there and I'm like, mm -hmm. well, this is fun, but I also have represented, you know, the greatest athletes in the world. Mm -hmm. And I've seen the strain on them that mm -hmm. you, you, it's hard to motivate them and say, look, you know, not only do you have to spend all your time on the court and expose yourself and people interrupting you when you're eating at the airport and your whole personal life, but now because you want this to be maintained and grow for the future, I need you to do this too. capture your own content, build mm -hmm. your own brand on the digital. And it's hard. You know, that's why a lot of, that's why I have a bigger following than most of the NBA. Mm hmm. Right, the only guys in the NBA that have a bigger following than me are the ones that can strictly just go right off their name, like LeBron and Kawhi, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But most of the guys that are the third, fourth, and fifth players, mm -hmm. they don't have the, the following I have. They don't mm -hmm. have millions of people watching them personally. Mm -hmm. So how do you connect the dots for them to inspire them for the future to say, hey, look, I know you really don't want to do this, but I'm looking out for your best interest. I'd love to be able to have your brand be more powerful when you're done playing and give you a security blanket for you, your children and grandchildren, because this is the time strike when the iron's hot sacrifice for me. Or do you think it's just a personal choice? And as long as you bring up the point to them and make them aware of it, it's fine. I think if you're really properly doing your job and you really care I think you don't just bring up the point to them. I think it's it's more like what you just said. You're really explaining to them and sitting them down and saying, this is where things are going. This brand can really carry you past when you're done playing. You don't know when you're, you're, you're done playing. You don't know when, you, I mean, we saw in the NBA finals how 
how things quickly can change. You know, you have a torn Achilles, you have a torn ACL. You know, it's it's sports in general. You don't know when you're done. So, you know, the point I said to you earlier is that you have this finite time where all the attention's on you, where where everybody wants to talk to you. You can open any door. You can people want to see what you're doing. And that's not and like you said, that's just not for the LeBrons and the Giannis's and those guys. The third, fourth, fifth guy, even the 10th through the 15th guy, they all have some form of following. They were all stars somewhere. Or they're sports agent. Yeah, yeah, or they're they're sports agent. You have have some form of following. So it's like, okay, well, you have this time. We can build something that's organic to you. And I think that's where you you hook them in and saying, hey, we're not saying we're going to make up something that's not you. What's organic to you? What are your interests? What do you do on a daily basis? How can we take this and, and promote it in the right way? And we can start building this. So once you're done playing, you have this to hang your hat on because, you know, you want to be you don't want to just be done. And then now the the, the checks stop coming. You want to be able to create something that you can just you can you can fall back on when you're done playing. There's certain guys that are, you know, that are that weren't superstars in the NBA that have built brands that they continue to you know, they continue to monetize. And that's what that's what I would want for my players and just explaining to them that process and what it can do. Just saying sacrifice now. You have you're practicing for however many times in it. I mean you you practice for two hours, you maybe get your individual work in for another two hours. You have another, you know, however many hours in the day. You can dedicate maybe one to two hours to building something for your future. And it's about getting them to see that vision and getting them to buy into that vision. So when they're done playing, they can, you know, look back and say, okay, well, slash sports, you know, they, you know, the, the guys there, they, they, they put, they push me, they push me to build this up. And now I'm grateful because I'm done playing and I have something that is going to bring checks in for perpetuity. And, you know, and that's what we want is that, that long-term goal. And you have a global perspective of it. You put guys all over the world Mm -hmm. and help them build futures to prepare themselves, not just in the NBA, which is extraordinary. Well, I really appreciate you coming on because I think these are the questions that, you know, it's one thing for me to answer from years ago, Mm -hmm. but you are the up and coming Jerry Maguire. You're Mm -hmm. one who's in the mix, educated, and you probably, you know, have a better insight on what it really takes to be a sports agent, what it's really like to be a sports agent today. And I really appreciate you because sports agents are truly entrepreneurs. You know that better than Mm -hmm. anyone. And so I appreciate it. We have... Harrison Gaines with Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs, The Playbook. Thank you.